Candace was a sanguine personality and she loved people. Even when she was a tiny child, she just gravitated towards people and people gravitated towards her. There was this excitement, immediacy about her that was unusual and people would comment on it and her favorite song became Friends Are Friends Forever and it was just the theme song of her and her life. Just beautiful. November 30th, she called me from school and asked me to come and pick her up, which I usually did on Fridays. And I expected her to come in, and she just disappeared on her way home from school. We went into a panic. We went investigated. All of Winnipeg started in with the, the biggest search in Winnipeg at that time. And then her body was found seven weeks later. She had died of hypothermia, but it was obvious that somebody had taken her to that shack, tied her and she died, and, uh, and that was the beginning and the end of it all. It started with this, you know, seven week search, which was very dramatic, but then we went into a kind of ambivalence and mystery for the next 22 years, and then a man was charged with Candace's murder, first degree. The first trial, which was appealed, the decision was reversed and then went to Supreme Court of Canada and was retried and was acquitted. He was acquitted. So it went from a, a mystery to a charge 22 years later to the first trial, six years, and then 10 years till it was all finished. So in all, it took 33 years for us to arrive at this place, which we feel is kind of a resolution. Not the one we expected, perhaps not the right one, but it is a resolution. What happened the day that her body was found is very important in our story because it was a day when everybody came to our house and they all brought food and it was really quite wonderful and that was kind of an in indication of the social climate in Winnipeg and how wonderful it was. But at 10 o'clock there was a knock on the door and we thought it was a friend coming back for mitts or something and it really was a man who declared himself as a parent of a murdered child. And then he looked vaguely familiar because we had seen him on, the, on media as well and he said, I've come to tell you what to expect. So we invited him to the kitchen table and there for two hours, he talked to us in vivid detail. He said, I can't work, I can't concentrate, and I have lost all the intimate relationships in my family. I am a broken man and, and the trial has absorbed me completely, I'm obsessed with it. And then he pulled out uh, at least 10 or, or five, whatever, black notebooks that he had taken during the, tr the two or three trials that he had endured. And he was just furious and he was just upset and he was everything that I was worried about. And he said, this is gonna happen to you. Oh, even at the very end, he said, I've lost the memory of my daughter. And that's when Cliff and I just kind of sat up and said, no, this can't happen to us. This is the normal. This is what we expect might happen to us. But is there another route? And that's when we chose to do something different. We knew it would have to be a choice. We could not succumb to the trauma that we had seen. And uh, we did not realize how difficult the journey would be. We just didn't realize. We thought we would just choose. <laughs> just choose to be positive rather than negative. Just choose to forgive rather than revenge. But it was not that easy. I realized I had changed, and so dramatically. And I was afraid of how fiercely I had changed. And so I went to a group called Family Survivors of Homicide, which were parents of mur murdered children. And that's when I thought that I was normal. That was the first realization. Oh, we're normal. <laughs> We are, we're all in disarray and we're all victimized and traumatized and all over the map, but we're normal. After every time we do a, a big circle, I would think, oh, that's, that theme is coming up continually from one meeting to the next meeting to the next meeting, and I started to write them down. That was the first thing we realized when the police came over that night, was that our story was fragmented. They said she was a runaway, we said she was abducted, and immediately our story was controversial, it was fragmented, and uh, we picked Jonah 
as the sculpture of that because it's uh, an example of how Cliff was working with words during that time. And Jonah is a story of a war of words. He just did not like the commandments that God had given him, so he, he risked his life to, to not gel with the story that was being given to him. And I think the way we put it on the Red River was that, you know, we want the flow of story. We want the harmony of story to flow, and we, and we work really, really hard at it. I think that anything creative and artistic can be therapeutic. Jonah was one of the earlier pieces I made, and I was at that point very, very angry. And uh, I was losing it. It wasn't like nobody knew this Cliff Dirks, and this was a new kind of Cliff that, and I was shocked myself. Like, I'd say, where did that come from? Like, at first I thought I could deal with it. Okay, this is small, you know, I can handle it, right? And then no matter how much self-discipline I seemed to apply, some incident would show up and I would once again say things that, and do things. I'd, I'd start throwing parcels around or, you know, it was not pretty. So I knew that if this continued, I was in trouble. I could lose my job. Uh, I could lose relationships. And the evil that had touched our life could now expand through me further. And my idea, our idea had been as a family that we were going to stop it here. This forgiveness thing was going to, that's it, it's done. And it's not going to move further. But here it could, with a potential was that it was moving further. Uh, a book I thought that was a story of Jonah that was sort of like not even applying to my life in any way, shape or form, I suddenly realized it applied perfectly. <laughs> like, more than I wanted to admit. I was a runner, just like Jonah was a runner, you know? Through the whole process of the book of Jonah, I realized I had to forgive. And so that was the time I began to think about that and actually um, pursue it and do it. After our story is fragmented, we, we enter into emotion. <laughs> we, are, uh, we react with huge emotion. And the first one is fear. Fear showed itself in the fact that I didn't leave the house after Candace disappeared and we looked for her. I didn't leave the house for six weeks after. Totally disrupted my whole pattern of life and routines because I would not leave the telephone. And we didn't have cell phones during that day. <laughs> and so I just changed my whole life patterns because I was so scared for Candace and I kept my children home. I was afraid to let anyone out of the house. The throne uh, of swords that we put up as fear is really about how we we, we go to war, uh, we, we want to, we have an enemy. All of a sudden we have an enemy. And, and the fighting of that and that place under the Nairn overpass was where Candace went when she probably went to the shed where she died. And so I know that Cliff went past that place. So everything came together underneath the Nairn overpass. Now, we are uh, showing the throne here in uh, two set, different settings. And the throne, first of all, uh, I was, when this happened to us, I had this crazy thing about, about evil and crime and why do, why do people do bad things? And uh, I, don't, I don't, it's not a natural curiosity on my part, like I never was interested in that before, um, specifically. But when this happened to us, and I think it happens to a lot of families and people who, who have serious stuff happening to them, like, well, why? How does this happen? And so I, I did that. And one of the things that I ran across was the Game of Thrones has uh, one of the kingdoms where that particular king has a throne of sorts. And I, it hit me like, wow, there's evil beyond evil. Like, and using the evil to, to make a statement to his subjects and to his neighbors and to whoever comes in contact with him, where he's collected the swords of all the dead soldiers and made a throne out of them. I actually now sit on your identity. Like swords were important to many people and leaders and so on. These swords had meaning. It took me a long time to make this piece. Uh, it was a challenge. 
in, in effect on its own, just a, you know, a big throne like this. It's the biggest piece I've ever made. I got tired of making the swords. I got tired of thinking about evil. And there were times where I put it aside under heavy wrapping and left it alone. I couldn't, I, I just, it wasn't really me. Um, and um, since I'd gone through that Jonah process, I was not that angry guy anymore. Rage is huge, and um, and it really collided with what we were all about. And that we're Me Mennonites, and I don't know if anybody knows anything about Mennonites, but we really presume and claim the fact that we know we have an edge on peace. We know how to deal with conflict. We know how to deal with anger, and we have a formula. I had one friend who came over, and she said, "What would it take for there to be justice?" And she demanded that I go into my heart and not answer with my head. I said that Candace was innocent and he was guilty. So there was no justice in him dying. But it still didn't satisfy me, so I had to go down deeper. And I said, 10 child murderers would have to die. And even that didn't satisfy me, even though I saw them fall in my imagination. And then finally I said, I would have to pull the trigger. And I pulled the trigger 10 times and it felt delicious really, really good. And I was really shocked and there goes my Mennonite identity. <laughs> and that's when I also realized how much I had changed and that I would never be the same and that I have this rage that, that is very destructive. It can be very constructive, but at that point was very destructive. And I, I was acting it out in many different ways, so I needed to know it. I needed to conquer it. And um, and that's what rage is all about, and it's huge. And I, then I went to Family Survivors of Homicide, and I said, do you all have revenge fantasies too? And they said, oh, yes. <laughs> and then we heard some of them, and oh, my. But it means that we love, right? When we really are hurt to the point of loving very deeply, we will respond, and one of them is rage. So we put uh, the werewolf right by the dam in Lockport, right by the dam because it's so hard to, to, to lock it, right? And it's just going to, it's rage is like water. It's just going to force anything down. It's really frightening to have that rage inside. And you know that you might not know what you're going to do the next minute if you don't contain it. It's huge. Disabling harm is about the physical losses that happen, and it's not only the child or those kind of losses, it's the actual ability to survive and to um, maintain life. And that's why we put the system in front of the Museum of Human Rights. How do we s have a system that incorporates everybody, inclus you know, that we're inclusive and we don't exclude anybody? And so victims, because of the nature of what happens to them, can often suddenly not fit. They are no longer employable. They can't concentrate. They can't do the things. They, their skills are gone. And so there's this huge fear of how do I fit in? How do I continue my independence? We were involved in the justice system through with our case. And we had no control. Art has to do with the, the, a prison ball that you have on your like they put on their uh, ankle and uh, but uh, it kind of feels like that where uh, even though we were in a trial and many we had several trials we still had no control as a family none whatsoever like if the crown wanted to do something we would have discussions with the crown and they said you can think what you like but uh, and you can t ask us what you think we should do or what's best what you like to do but in the end we'll do what we have to do so that's why I called the peace systems, because there are many systems in this world and we all are part of them. And uh, some systems will treat you kindly, but many of them won't and you don't have any control like we did with the justice system, we had no control. And so the image is simply of hands coming in and out of the ball in different, with different attitudes. And for different people looking at it, they'll have different thoughts about what those attitudes are, but it, it, it has to do with how you get treated by a system.
and we chose um, Cliff's fence post um, sculpture because it really shows the tortured face, which is an example of the tortured mind, how the mind is bound, and every time there's just pain inside, and it cycles around and around because it needs to find a way out. And all time is lost. There's a, a time um, warp as well where it, your whole timeline is shifted. There is a before Candace and an after Candace now in our lives. And everything is categorized and organized in a different way. And so that's kind of where we wanted it uh, to be against the dead, dead hay of something very, very painful that people can't see. It's not as if you're sitting, lying in a hospital bed where people are gonna say, oh, I can see that you're in pain, you're everything, you're broken. To have a broken mind is very, very painful because it's not seen and it's not understood. We as human beings need to find a cause for the tragedy and we will go to any length to find and to blame somebody. And uh, the first thing was to realize how irresponsibly we do the blaming. We don't always choose the offender. We would rather choose somebody safe, somebody who's close to us and whom we, we might have resentments against anyway, usually, and that's usually family. <laughs> so rather than putting all our blame out there to the actual person who murdered our child, we really had to watch the blame inside of us and anyone that came close to us. I know that we blamed the police a long time. We blamed for not going out and searching for her immediately. I liked Cliff's um, sculpture and that it shows pondering, how it's such a long time where we just ponder who is to blame and how do we fix what is to blame. And I guess the sunflowers are just a beautiful contrast that they are huge too, and so we, we, you know, this whole, where do we focus on and, and, and how do we continue to live with that? And it, in our own family, it was really hard. It, it often came out in blame for each other, you know? Cliff could have blamed me for not picking Candace up, but he never said those words, not once. And that was terribly important. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Doubt was made in response to what's happening in our court system in Canada. It has to do with the Crown and the defence, especially the defence. The defence apparently has very few rules about what they say in court. And it has become clear that they will say almost anything. So the defence basically said whatever they wanted to say, and they would do it uh, just in a sense of the old proverbial way is say you just throw stuff on the wall like you know throw the spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks and basically it was like that and um, us being a little more you know we had we had shaken his hand at the beginning and we had said we don't want to have a false conviction we want to make sure you know crown and defense do a good job so we shook his hand and said we wish you well we want you to do a good job because we want to make sure that whoever is the arrested person is the right one right but we had not said yes to this kind of thing. Like that was unexpected, right? And so I made this piece because I thought and still feel that if this route continues, it become, it's become a game. And that's, uh, that's, that's destructive and it's, uh, I think the future of that is dramatically gonna collapse at some point. Oh, the offender and the, the bond that we had. And I became very fascinated with anybody who was a sexual predator, because I always suspected it was that. Like, Candace didn't have anything else except her sexuality. And she was just a 13-year-old thir child growing up all of a sudden in a woman's body, and she had no idea what was going on, and, and prime target for anyone with those kind of desires. So I knew all along. And I would just almost seek out offenders. In fact, I did find an offender 
who would listen to me on the outside. And I, he was once the most wanted man in Canada. I got his contact and I started to, I think, interrogate him. And um, then finally he says, you know what? I, c I don't have your answers to your questions. I'm going to have to bring you to the people who know. So what he did was arrange for me to meet lifers in, Prin in Stony Mountain. So I went in. <laughs> and the guards all left the room and I had a chance to ask what is this about offenders why do you murder and so I asked them if they would and I could ask any question I wanted and I asked them to give me the reason why they had murdered without any excuse and they knew that they could not give any excuse because I was they could feel my anger I was told and so they were very honest with me so they gave me the exact stories of how they had murdered and what had led up to that. And that was a remarkable insight and an emotional understanding and learning that I needed as well. And um, there were all types of men in there. There were teacher types, big gang leader types and everything. And uh, that was um, when I think I realized and changed. The, um, the victim offender trauma bond is when I realized I didn't want to kill them. There were 10 men in that room. It was kind of a serendipitous kind of moment when I realized there were 10. And they had shown through their stories that they were human to me. And even though I'll never condone murder, and I think we have to deal with it, um, I could feel compassion for them. So that was a huge turning time in my life. And that's also why we went to Stony Mountain and had the penitentiary there in the background with Samson, who had all of the victim and offender stuff going on inside of him as well. Samson was a uh, leadership and uh, he treated women really badly. And that was one of the things that bothered me about, about this journey was that one of my kind, a man, had taken my daughter. And how could I resolve this, that one of my kind would do something like this to me, to another man? Like to take their daughter and destroy their daughter and uh, somebody completely innocent. Um, we need to know the truth. Truth releases us to continue our lives. And so there's this huge, and we didn't know. We didn't know who it was for 26 years. So this was huge for us. And we had to learn how to live in a mystery and to let go of needing to know the truth, but it was always there. And so when the trial came up and the man was charged, we of course put all our hope in the DNA because that was going to be the definitive answer for absolutely everything. And so Cliff became part of obsessed with this DNA and so did I. We, we became scientists, <laughs> biologists in DNA. And I guess what, why we wanted the place, the hotel, is that it was downtown and, and DNA is messy. It's kind of in downtown, it's the basis of life. And uh, as it turned out, it is unreliable. There's no definitive truth ever. And we were always surprised how important it was. Just the tiniest little detail of knowing where her body was and how it was placed and everything that had happened to her because her body's terribly important. And, um, and even though it hurt to know that the rodents had been there in her clothes and in her body, it was still important to know those kind of details and the kind of, my imagination is far worse than any truth will ever be. <laughs> so I needed to know it all. And then we can just put it to rest and put it under the, um, the, uh, the knowing. So we don't have the fear of unknown. The fear of unknown is much bigger than the fear of the known. Oh, the, uh, grief displacement is really tough because there's a normal grief that I think is even hard for all of us because it's, it's never normal <laughs> But when we lose somebody. But with murder, it's very complicated because the control is taken out of our hands and somebody has imposed grief on us. The tied hands was a very difficult and emotional piece for me. It was hugely therapeutic. One of the things about clay is that you can grab it in your hands, you can squeeze it and you can throw it. And part, a lot of the working with the clay is actually very muscular and very rough and you know, you gotta beat it to get the air out of it and to make, it, to make 
for it to survive the kiln. Um, but in this case, I actually debated in my head very, over a very long period of time, should I make something so intimate? You know, what I wanted to do was experience what Candace had experienced frozen in the shed in those seven weeks. What was that like? What had she actually gone through? And as a father, that was one of the things that bothered me too, was as a father, I wasn't able to protect my daughter. But I knew that she was hogtied and uh, that she suffered severely. And so I made the piece, um, intending him to make her hands on the piece. So I made the arms, the elbows up, and then where the wrists cross, I made the rope, and it was time to make the hand part. And I stopped. I could not make her hands. So again, I wrapped the piece up and I thought, well, that's history. I don't think I'll be able to finish that one. And then about a week or two later, I realized I had the idea that I could make them my hands. That way there would still be a piece and it would be actually what I actually mean by that. And that is that I wish it would have been me instead of her. All of that, what that symbolizes is how, how hard it is just to accept a loss. And when it is overshadowed with so many issues, sad, uh, grief is a place of non-energy. It's not a happy place. It's always ugly and it's so much easier to choose a different emotion rather than grief. So, to, so we force ourselves into that, that place and that's why we put the, um, the hands on the railway tracks so very close to the railway tracks which became so symbolic of Candace's disappearance and torture. We are social human beings and uh, we find that our status and our position in life totally changes when we've experienced the murder of a child. The man came and said, I'm a murdered, a parent of a murdered child too and I realized right then my world had changed. And it still has. I'm still introduced as a parent of a murdered child. I was sort of unaware. I mean, I, I made this piece and I had some fun with it. And, uh, but I also knew that there's a real serious side to this piece. And uh, David did suffer for what he did there. Um, I mean, when he uh, had her, asked for her to come to his palace and, and uh, uh, it wasn't like she had a choice. So he was uh, the king, he was a powerful person, and what he said went. And um, he suffered for it. But the thing that I didn't realize was, this was actually a repeat of our story. It was a guy following our daughter, and he knew of her. And so that's the same kind of in incident where somebody's checking her out somehow, you know, as a guy. and. Uh, so that's what happened, and I only found this out after I had made the piece. Somebody said, that's your story. And I <laughs> wow. And I began to realize that the art that you make can say things that you have no idea what they're saying. And it is our story, and it, it was a repetition of it. And so that was the shocker of that piece. And um, it's at the LOA Arch, which is about the Winnipeg Foundation. And they are an organization that helped us a lot. There's a Candace Dirksen Fund in their foundation. And they are all about changing our identities. So that, there's hope in that one as well. We were surprised how much our faith was shown. It's, you know, we had a sense of who God was in our own, our theology, and Cliff was even a pastor at one point, and we both went to Bible schools and everything. And we, are, we were then faced with the question, where was God when Candace was suffering? And do we, can we ever trust that God again? And that's not easy, because that question came up immediately very much more quicker than I thought it would. It was at the night when Candace disappeared, I was asking God, help, 
you know, and, and you're our superpower. We need, we, we don't, we're out of control here. We need a superpower that is, um, loves us and is going to look after us. And so all of that had to be totally reorganized and changed. And that's not easy. That's not, and I think it happens in all faiths. And I think there are answers in all faiths. Um, but it's really a tough question. And, and so Cliff, um, during that time, the shack, the book, the shack just came out. So he put the shack in God's hands as kind of, we like the messiness of the shack. We like the messiness of, of playing with this new theology until it becomes really our own again. And it's not uh, a God that's just found in church anymore. It has to be a God that is in the shack and was there with Candace. And how do we put that together? And that's why we put it in the ruins. We wanted it to be in the ruins here where God is also in the ruins. Then we went, after 26 years, we were uh, part of the justice process. And I was always worried about that. In fact, we had come to really appreciate the time of mystery and not having to deal with the justice system. Because I had seen a lot of people coming into Parents of Murdered Children group. They could deal with the murder. But when it came into trial, the trial system is very demeaning towards victims. It's um, a huge system. It's like an elephant and we're a mouse within the system. It's, there's just so many complications within the system that it, it starts to re-victimize and, and um, demean us. A simple illustration is that I can go to Walmart and I can be greeted by greeters and they'll say, hi, how are you? And you know, we get so much grace and so much uh, courtesy all over and yet we were never once in all the days that we were I think we were three or four months within the courtroom not once were we ever acknowledged it's really hard to go someplace where you're ignored where you're considered almost the enemy when when it was your daughter that was killed now we all know that there is a justice lady that uh, the Commonwealth has made up you know there's the lady with the sword the scales and she's blindfolded and uh, and represents justice. Now I thought that with the DNA coming in, things were changing with the whole justice system. And I felt that the justice lady that's used everywhere in this world as the symbol of justice needed to have that reflected in her. So I made a new justice lady. <laughs> Who do I think I am, right? <laughs> so that whole, even though it's not visible and it's not intentional, it has this way of getting to you after a while. So you don't come out of it feeling better for it. You come out of it feeling, I've endured, I've survived. And um, justice is so somewhat blind when it comes to victims. And I think that blindfold around the, the, the eyes and the, and the scale is kind of indicative of how we felt about justice sometimes. And, Dancing David is um, controversial and it's uh, kind of the way the whole path through this 15 elements is all about is that some people say it should be done this way. You know, everybody has rights, everybody uh, has a way of dealing with all of this and it's very, it, be it becomes very heated and controversial. Um, the, the debate of revenge versus forgiveness and all these sometimes not helpful debates are part of the issues as well, like how do we do this and, and what's the right way to go through it. So it's also recovery controversy. And that's why we put David, who was very controversial, dancing nude. He had a big fight with his wife over all of that. <laughs> David is my hero. So I've got so many Davids that I've made so far, so, you know, up to this point, and I probably will continue making more of them. there's still joy in our lives. There was a time where we say, thought we would never smile again. And uh, we've come to realize, yes, it was bad, it was serious, and it took a long time to get over it. I remember seven years later, my wife and I were having our anniversary dinner in the revolving restaurant, and uh, uh, we were saying, 
and we were kind of saying it carefully, we're actually feeling good. You know, this is actually, we're actually smiling. Let's not tell anybody, you know. And we were shocked ourselves, but it was happening. Joy was starting to eke into our lives again. Uh, resting David is the perfect example of how tired we got. Uh, it's of, of David, King David, not even able to get out of his armor. There's no place that you can just sort of disrobe. You're always in a defense mode in the garden that is so perfect, and yet he's in battle fatigue in, in, a, in many ways. That there does never seem to be an adequate closure through this whole process. Closure becomes almost a dirty word for crime victims and for us as well, where there, is, there was no closure and the closure that we finally got wasn't the one we wanted. I, I just um, needed rest. Um, David had been fleeing from Saul for seven years and uh, this was a 33 year journey and so I kind of identified with him and sort of take the rest where you can. Um, Dealing with my anger was one of the big things that ended up being restful, so to speak. I made that peace with the, with the whole idea that he's completely dressed, he's ready for military action, and he knows it can happen anytime, but he's just taking a moment, he's taking a deep breath, and taking some time. And that's why we worked very hard at creating our own closures right throughout. After every trial and after every process, we always had a party <laughs> and we always had ceremonies. We had white rose ceremonies and at the very end we had a 33 candle ceremony and um, we found out that there is no closure but you can fashion any closure you want whenever you want. So that's how we dealt with it. Paralyzing despair is at the end of it all when people are stuck and we and that's the worst place to be and that was the one word that I wanted to avoid. In fact, when I asked my psychologist's son, when do I go for help? He says, when you're stuck. It's the worst. And there have been some British research that has been done that everybody who's experienced murder has wanted to commit suicide at one point. And we did too. We wanted out of here. It's just too tough. The piece for me is just the overall feel and reality of who David is in my life and uh, it's kind of composite it's got a it's got a sheep head because he was a shepherd but also because he represents the forerunner of Christ he has Goliath's sword because he defeated Goliath and we put him right in the legislative building because that's a place of power it's a place of um, at the bottom of the stairs you know you have to climb the stairs and get up and get moving and just keep moving and that was sometimes the 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 only challenge in, in, in the day was to get up and just start moving. Just despair, depression, chronic depression, because it just defeats us. It, it's just too impossible to see our way through. And the fear, the rage, everything, all of the issues culminate in despair. It's just too big. Feathered hands. <clears throat> when I made the piece, uh, seven weeks that I was describing where the hands are tied like this and the hands are mine, I uh, wasn't, I, I was happy with the piece and all that, what it meant, but it had deep meaning for me, but I felt the story didn't end there. Like if that's the only piece I was gonna make about what happened to my daughter, then it was unfinished. It did, felt that's a bad kind of place to be constantly. And I felt that Candace had been victorious. So the, the symbol is simply a freedom where she was able to fly away kind of thing. That's the rope is breaking away, chains are breaking away, and she's free. Cliff wanted to, to have freedom for her, and that's what we were talking about when he made the, the feathered hands. That was kind of almost our own wish together that Candace has freedom. She, she's not going to stuck. She's not stuck tied up. <laughs> Anything to unstuck, even the memory. You have to make the hands that are tied, but then you have to say, I'm going to choose a different way. 
which we did when the man dis uh, came to visit us. We said, we're going to just choose. We're not quite sure which way we're going to go, but we're just going to get out of this rut. And um, that that is the whole point of, of the beginning of letting go. Because once you've let go, once you're out of the rut, then all of a sudden the potential is there and it just displays itself for you. Project Angel actually is the name that the police gave to the cold case when they started it. They called the Candace Dirksen case the Project Angel case, which is kind of a lovely name. Um, the other, um, the hands with the, the locket are about friendship because uh, Cliff made that for Heidi who was Candace's best friend. And in doing so and in, in having that one in the garden and at the end was kind of saying that really it is about friends. People often ask how we did so well. Well I think it's because we had a lot of attention and we had a lot of community and a lot of good friends and a lot of goodwill. Just a a lot of positive, loving influence in our lives right from the beginning. And that love is so important to keep going. And that's what we wish for other people now in creating Candace House and all of that is to help create community for everybody who's losing something because we need each other. We just do and uh, we need to stay in society. And as society we need to incorporate everybody, even the men in prison are not really there to reject and to ostracize. We should always be looking for ways to, to bring them back because they are stories. They're all stories and we, they're valuable to who we become. We need to have the conversations though. <laughs> we have to say, hey, why did you do it and why did you do it? And as long as you're in that mode, you've got to stay put. You can't, you can't harm anyone else. So we have to have those difficult conversations. But I still think that it's the love that keeps us powerful and keeps us moving and growing. I had to do something different with the throne. And it took me a long time to think about it. Like, like who do I put in the chair of the throne? Or what do I do with this throne to make it fit me? But then I thought, what if I make the throne, the swords do something else? What if I make kind of an arrangement on the seat and I made these sort of swords turning into feathers? Feathers speak of nurturing, speak of warmth, speak of comfort. That has resolved the issue for me now. I can, I can show the, the throne of sword and, and, and yes, it's me now. I think that's about recycling the the tragedy. It's about taking that moment of greatest fear and torture and under the Nairn overpass that Cliff had as, as the symbol of the evil that was present and that was in control of our lives at that moment and taking them to a garden and you know there's the throne full of swords, full of everything that's torturous and murderous and evil and ugly and negative and planting some feathers in it and that's probably the big part of recycling, always recycling, changing the old and the ugly into something beautiful. And, and I think it still can be done. It's still a challenge though. <laughs> and we're in life too, you know, there's never a day that goes by when we're not faced with that challenge. Like how do we turn this moment, which isn't quite working out, into something beautiful? Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But it has to, we have to try.